right, so on the typical day when it actually starts, I'm going to be a PE teacher for the uh, lower school. So that's, um, I guess, K through fifth. Um, when that's from eight to noon, once noon is done, I'll have athletes coming in in my block sessions. So that will range from middle schoolers for two groups and then high schoolers for the remaining uh, groups to follow. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring, bringing on some of the best guests and having interesting conversations. This week, I have one of my former interns. Crazy, we were talking uh, before, yes, sir, <laughs> talking before we recorded. Um, he he worked with us in 2019. You were essentially the third person on staff with Joe and I. Like we used the word intern, but it just meant that like you weren't getting paid, but you were doing like everything, right? Like, so Steven Yorkman, you're now, what's your official title as the head strength coach at uh, Gilman? So I'm the head strength and conditioning coach at Gilman. That's the title. Okay. Um, so introduce yourself. So everybody's aware of who you are and, and what you're doing. Then we'll just dive in. Gotcha. What's going on everybody? My name is Steven. So I'm originally from the Bowie, Maryland area. Um, growing up, I had the traditional, I guess, from the conditioning coach background. I played a lot of sports, wasn't really good at any of them, but I really loved the weight room. Um, once I got into college, I realized that I wanted to do that full time, just to try to figure out how I can stay around the weight room as much as possible. So I asked a guy named Joe Walsh if I can intern under him at Dell State. I did that for a semester, and I enjoyed my time and tenure there. Once I got done at Dell State, I wanted to continue, and once I moved back home to Maryland, and then by the grace of God, I met Coach Lima. I interned there, um, I want to say from 20, I guess 2018 through 2019 or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, I think it was close to a year. Anyways, um, during that time, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, we ended up having a baby, so it didn't make sense for me to try to get a GA ship anywhere, so I went into work at a private sector. I did the private sector world for about four years, and that led me to where I am today. So that's yeah. actually one of the first areas that I wanted to ask you a question about, because you know a lot of our listeners, and with what Kier's been doing with money moves and people in the private sector, is what was life in the private sector like for somebody fresh out of college? Because like, that's a grind. Yes, it is. So like, I would honestly say, like. At first, I think, you know, going into it, I had like a, you know, work, work, work mentality. I wanted to get as many clients as possible. And then as years went on, it just started becoming a bit draining. So like my typical day would start off at like 6 a.m. and I wouldn't get done at 8 o'clock at night. Holy um, I, like Now, with that being said, that wouldn't be like I'm seeing clients every hour on the hour. There are like gaps in the middle of the day. Um, but it just became a grind. Like it, it also wasn't conducive to have a family and come home to my wife and kid being dead tired at eight o'clock, just have to get back up and do it again. Um, so yeah, bit of a grind. But you know, within that, because the reason I ask it is so many strength coaches in college, they, they maybe have that six to eight life in college. Mm -hmm. So they look to go private to get away from that. How did you manage it? How, like, what would be some of your advice that you'd give to listeners out there? So I would say like, if you're gonna go into the private route and like this is your first time ever doing strength and conditioning, try to get as many clients as possible uh, at first. That way you just get a huger bandwidth of um, people that you can work with. Um, once you start getting good, start to really be strict with your time. Like there, it was at a point in time where, geez, like I would be working with like old grandmas and soccer moms from six to 12, I would have a two hour break and then I would have middle school and high school athletes coming in from 3.30 to nine o'clock. Um, after a while and just speaking with my wife and also talking to the managers that I've had, I you know, really expressed like, this is not conducive for my health or for my family and I need to try to limit my time and so how can I maximize the hours that I have? Um, so rather than doing like one-on-ones, I really strived and pushed to get group classes and once you get group, group classes, you get paid well, so you can maximize the amount of people that are in your your group, or your group um, and also reduce the amount of time that you're working on the floor. So um, the last place that I was at, I was probably averaging like maybe five or four hours like actually um, coaching, but the rest of the day I got to be home with my kid and take him to swim class and do what I wanted to do. So like once you, starting off, try to get as many clients as possible, 
and then once you start getting good at working with a lot of people, really, really be strict with your time. That's like my biggest advice for anybody. How did you go about handling that? Because you mentioned like, okay, grandmas and soccer moms, and you, you mentioned like a wide range of people. How did you go about structuring those groups to be conducive for you time-wise, but also do your due diligence as a coach training them? So big thing like for my adult people they want to come in like anywhere between the hour of like six to eight o'clock so like any time pre-work so i would try my best to get people that are close to the same skill level or fitness goals whatever the case may be in those blocks of hours and then once i was done those two hours in the morning um i put a huge block in the middle of my day to take my kid to swim class whatever the case may be and then come back for uh, post-school stuff, so I would get back at like 3.30 and do my high school groups, and then try to see if there was any other kid that needed to get training done, whether it be a one-on-one or um, some other team training that needed to be done, but i try to mark it off at six o'clock, um, so yeah. And within your team training, were you doing the same process, or was it like, hey, based off of when a kid was or wasn't playing a sport, that they could show up, or were you doing your training solely based upon the skill level of the athlete and the sport they played? No. So like the for private sector, it's a little bit different. So like you, one, like you're not really going to have the opportunity to like, um, at least this is my perspective. This is what I've dealt with in the past. I did not have the opportunity to like separate kids based on skill skill. Like if, this kid had to come in at five o'clock and this is his first time ever lifting and he's like 100 pounds and i have like a d1 lacrosse commit i have to maximize that hour because that's what the parent paid for they pay for that hour so what ends up happening is you just have to be fluid with the periodization in your programming and making sure that the d1 commit gets what he needs to get done and also the younger dude gets what he needs to get done well um so yeah that's been like what I've dealt with in the past in the private sector. <clears throat> How'd you go about handling that working on the floor with such such differences? And what do you recommend to anybody out there that's like, okay, man, he's speaking to me right now. Like I got that going on, you know, yes. because like you said, you got to take what you can get when people and parents are paying for it. So what did you do and what would be your strategy if you could kind of do it again to anybody that's listening and, and this is hitting home to them? So like, Big thing is just like you want to make sure that everybody is hitting their big rocks, right? Like no matter what, like like the D1 commit and the younger dude, they're all going to benefit from some level of some general strength training stuff, some level of speed power work, and some level of movement variability. How I went about it, I would have everybody starting together off. We would do our speed and power work. So we sprint, we jump, we throw, we throw med balls. Once we got into the weight room, if I had a squat pattern program for that day, maybe my D1 commit is doing a safety bar squat. And I have my younger guy, this is his first time ever coming in, we're doing a goblet squat variation. Um, so like the movement stays the same, the way that you load the movement is going to be your, your difference there. Um, once kids start to get, and then you'll have this problem too, like, like you'll get a kid that's like, hey man, I really, really want to try that safety bar progression. It's like, no, like you got to know where you are, kid. And then this bar is 65 pounds, you're 100, this is going to crumble you. Like you got years and years to progress you, he's ready to go off to college. So like. Making sure that kids understand why they're doing things, I think, is important too. Um, like it can be sometimes I I've I've seen it like it can be depressing for some kids who think they are ready for um, the bigger movements or they think they're ready for you know whatever the college kid is doing. You're 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 not, um, but that's okay. We just we're making sure that we are you know trying to progress your athletic athletic capabilities for the long term. <clears throat> within you know those different structures how often did you have any of your college athletes or high school athletes that you were training in the private sector mm -hmm. that you had to do movements with them to prepare them for what would be coming in college and it was like all right say you don't believe in doing um just regular back squats or whatever mm -hmm. and you're like hey they know that they're going to get tested on it day one how did you go about handling your own personal philosophy being a private sector coach and doing your part for your client so like to be honest i i like i did not do that um and i would just explain to them like listen if you're a generally strong person like 
and we load you in a squat variation, if you get a bar on your back, yeah, there'll be some variance to it, but you'll be able to do that move, and it's not going to be like your first time ever, and you're not going to know what to do. Um, and a lot of my kids got strong, so like, I don't think they had like the um, fear factor of trying a different movement out for their first time. Um, like case in point, I had a girl, she's been with me for a year and a half. She started off, she's been ready to go to school at Shenandoah. Um, we've been training for a year and a half. She's up to a, what, 315 shot bar deadlift um, for a few reps. She can search a squat 185 for a few reps. Like she's wow. ready. Um, so we've never done any back squatting variations just yet, but I'm not concerned about her trying to do that for the first time. No, oh, that's interesting that you're like, hey, you know what? We're going to get good at some of these other random things. And like, yeah, sure, you're going to put the bar on your back, but you've handled heavy you've load handled and strength. whatnot. Handled yeah. Strength. Like, I, like, just because you haven't had a, like, once again, just because you haven't had a bar on your back squatting doesn't mean you've never squat with heavy load before. You're just doing it in a different capacity. Oh, it's an interesting thought process with that. And uh, one of the last questions I'll have on this private sector stuff is, how did you go about assessing their performance progression with them to kind of prove like, Hey, you signed me, you asked me to do X. Here's proof that I did it with you. And maybe you didn't. And if you didn't, what would be some things that you recommend to people listening out there? Right. So like for me, like just to make sure that kids are doubting and making sure that they know they're doing, like they're progressing. Well, we had three like tests that we had by the grace of God, we had fly or timing gates. So we would do, our main main movement would be flying 10, so build 10, fly 10s. If they saw improvements on those numbers, then by default we know that we're getting some speed gain as well as some strength gain as well because in order for you to move faster, you have to produce force into the ground at a rapid rate. Um, outside of that, we would do vertical jumps and broad jumps. And also like with those movements, we also train them almost every single, not every single day, but like at least twice per week. So even if we weren't testing it, we were doing it. And so I'm not sure if the kids realize it, but like they just got really, really good at those movements. Um, and then by default, they got, they progressed or they got better at them. Um, that's not to say like it was just a standard, very standard sprint or, or a standard built in fly 10 or a standard just jump mat we would do variations of it but the main thing was the same and they just saw improvements with their with their um kpis per se so how about your uh your older population were you having grandma and mom doing fly tens too or oh, no, were no. they they weren't they weren't just gripping yeah, and ripping no. doing their fly tens and like trap bar deadlift hell no so like with them they saw improvement when they felt that they felt good like um, when your soccer mom is telling you like, Hey, I feel good picking up my kid and walking around. Like that's how they know they're, they're getting their improvements. And not only that, like, obviously everybody wants to look better, especially in the general pop world. So if they start seeing physical improvements and they feel like they're moving better, they, that's where you start seeing progression with them. And that's when they really want to keep coming back. Um, I think you can flash like, Oh yeah, you did a two twenty five pound goblet squat. Now you're doing a 50. That's great. But like. I don't think that really means anything to a general soccer mom. Like she just wants to make sure that she looks good and she can, you know, play with her kid. Amen. So <clears throat> switching gears and talking about kids, you now are working with them. You're working in the high school setting. Um, have you officially started yet? Yeah. So I did a soft start in May. I did all this spring training for the football team at Gilman. And now I'm officially there. So... I'm, I'm their full-time strength and conditioning coach, so I do a hour in the morning with all their kids. So anybody that wants to come in from 8 to 9.30, they'll train with me. Then from 9.30 to 10.45, I'll have the football team in. And you're doing that uh, every day of the week during the summer now? Yep. That's awesome, man. Um, what is it like going into the high school setting? Because, you know, you have this unique role of, you know, you're now doing – a subset of what some of our members are doing. They're working in high school, whether it be down in Texas or uh, a little bit over here in the mid Atlantic, but there's a growing, growing contingent of coaches getting out of college. Cause they're like, I'm done with this. And they're either going private like you did, or now uh, the youth high school thing. So you did the soft start. What is your recommendation to anybody that maybe just did the exact same thing? Looking back on it, what would you make sure that you did you would tell them to do and some things you'd be like, Hey, make sure you don't do this. Cause I did it. And boy, it was a mistake. 
to get into the high school or like like just being in high school? Let's go both. How do you, how do you get started in it? And then once you're in within, you know, you just completed your first month. So, hey, how to get in it. And then within your first month, make sure you do this. Make sure you don't do that. Yeah. So I guess to get in it, like, to be honest, I think I just really got freaking lucky with the connections that I've had. Like, I, I really can't tell you other than that. So get in Strength Coach Network is what you're saying. Make yes. sure you have people that you know to help get you to the front of the line. Yes, but also too, like, um, even when you're interning, like, what, what was it? I had interned with you like years ago. We've stayed connected and you've also helped me out getting multiple connections throughout like your community. I think you have to be really stringent or not even stringent, but just make sure that you know where you're interning and you know like after this, that these people really think highly of you and they're gonna be willing to put your name into hats, right? Like I think it, there's a lot of times where I've heard a lot of stories where, you know, people are interning and all they did was like just clean up the weight room and that was like that they didn't get any coaching experience but because of that like that coach never felt comfortable with to telling this guy like oh try to talk to them or this girl try to talk to them um so just be really mindful with like where you go to intern and also really reach out to as many people as possible you don't know you don't know who people know and that's how you got that's how i got my foot in the door um now with training the kids the biggest piece of advice i would say is like know how to maximize your space so mm -hmm. there'll be points in time when i'm with a football team i'm one dude but i'll have like 65 to 75 people in the weight room at a time what yes, yes. so with hold that, on how yeah. I'm oh not my like, gosh yes yeah. so the first two so this is week one mind you this was last year uh, the Gilman's football team averaged like 35 to 45 people at a time. And so I was told like, be ready for 35 to 45 kids. So I had my programming for the week done. Like, all right, bet I'm going to have 35, 45 kids. I go outside and I see these, this army of children ranging from like hundred pound kids to like the D1 Penn State commit that's there. And I'm just like, all right, well, I got to figure out how to train them. So like, number one, know how to maximize your space and don't be married to your program like i had to switch stuff up on the fly and almost make it like i don't want to say circuit style but damn near it because i had like 75 kids at a time so I, I can't have people just moving all throughout the floor randomly um so just maximize your space and know or don't be married to whatever programming that you may have for that week one or week two. Always be adaptable to it because you never know what would happen. Wow, that like I mean, first of all, was this an indoor <laughs> session or outdoor? Like the fact you, indoor, outdoor, I was about indoor. to say like you have a heck of a weight room if you're able to have that number of kids oh, in there at no. one time. No, 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 no. Like that's incredible that you'd be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And as you are, you know, you just talked about internships. How are you going to go about trying to build that then? Because we talk about like, okay, you're forecasting. What would be any of the abilities to kind of try to grow that within having people come in to help you? And especially because you've had experience, you know, interning at Dell State with Joel and then here. Um, so to be honest, I haven't thought of, I mean, I've thought about it loosely with creating like an internship program at Al Gilman. Um, there's been a few kids that were just people that I met through Instagram and just in the space of life that have expressed interest in like learning how to do strength conditioning. I think my process, my thought process is when like, if there's a college kid that is looking to train, like, but is also interested in strength conditioning, inviting them to come in and like, Hey, listen, like, I need your help coaching. If you really enjoy this, like. I can also teach you things, but I'll also train you for free because I can't I can't afford to pay you like anything. Um, but I do have a I guess a decent knowledge base to teach you two or three things that I can at least reach out to the next person that I know would be able to take you a little bit further. Um, so yeah, like that's a good point. How do you, you you and I were speaking off air about how you have a wide range of athletes' age? Talk a little bit about that so that way, because, again, there might be people that are taking over high school and they do have middle school kids. Like, talk about what your day looks like and how you're going to go about training those people. Taking a quick break from the show, everybody. Promise this will take less than 15 seconds. Friendly reminder, go ahead, hit that subscribe button below. It helps us out and it helps you out by being notified whenever we have new content come out. So hit that subscribe button. And with this, let's get back to the show. All right. So 
on the typical day when it actually starts, I'm going to be a PE teacher for the lower school. So that's, um, I guess, K through fifth. Um, when that's from eight to noon, once noon is done, I'll have athletes coming in in my block sessions. So that will range from middle schoolers for two groups and then high schoolers for the remaining uh, groups to follow. Um, the biggest, I guess, how I'm going to plan to go about this is to literally follow a long-term athletic development model. Like for my PE classes, we're doing the fundamentals, making sure kids get a huge wide bandwidth of movement variability. So like we're doing different skipping variations. We're going to do different crawling variations. I'm going to introduce gymnastics to them. Um, once we get into the middle school aspect, we're going to start learning how to train accordingly. So like learning different squatting variations, how to properly hinge, we'll get a little bit more um, strategic or sh have a little bit more of a structured base. And then once we get into our high school classes, um, we're going to get into train to win or train to compete. So now we're starting to have a little bit more of a tailored structure with it, whether it be a one by 20 model or we're doing like an APRE based model. Um, with all those middle school and high school guys, I want to make sure that I am just getting the mini uh, minimum uh, dosage on everything and just progress it from there. <clears throat> how do you, I know how I feel about it. Like you're going to start pulling out bands and chains with all these high school kids and doing oh, like no. super maximal, eat, you know, loading and tendoing it and what, like. No. So like, and I, I think it's like, let me take a back step. Like being in the private sector, I found like there was a lot of like to get views on Instagram, Twitter, whatever the case may be, like you would see a lot of trainers doing like French contrasts with their eight year old <laughs> lacrosse phenom or football phenom. And it's just like, bro, like my man hasn't even learned how to do like extensive plyos yet. Like, what are we talking about? Um, so <laughs> slow cook the crap out of your athletes. Like there's no reason why we should be doing maximum effort method with anybody. Like just get a general strength base with your kids, make sure that they move well, give them a wide bandwidth of movement and progress them from there. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Like I think it's just, you need common sense, but I think nowadays common sense really isn't that common. On the flip side, how are you going to handle parents that maybe are like, cause now you have to, you've been dealing with parents of kids, but now you might have to deal with a parent talking to you or talking to that football coach and saying like, I did see this on Instagram. Why isn't so-and-so doing it? Like, how do you handle that? It's just explaining it to them in a very polite way. Like, hey, listen, like, this is great and dandy, but what we want to make sure that we're doing is that. <laughs> he <laughs> said dandy. great and dandy. <laughs> I just did. But if this awesome. is great and dandy and all, however, like, our, our kids are not ready for that. We want to make sure that we are mastering the movements efficiently before we start progressing things um, accordingly. And also, too, explaining to them, like, hey, these methods were designed for like your Olympic level athlete. Your kid is 13 years old. Let's look at where we are and maybe where we want to go and how do we get there. Um, it's just just explaining it to them. No, that that's a great point. Um, I do want to now switch gears to what you talked about before with respecting personal time and respecting and being a family man because you've talked about that before and how that's important. Um, how do you balance being a husband, being a father, and still wanting to be a successful and a good coach because, I mean, when you were interning for us, you were driving a long distance. Like, you were clearly dedicated to working, and you, like you said, you six to eight, whatever. How do you handle that dichotomy or whatever word you want to use? Um, I feel like this is kind of cliche, like, not cliche, but, like, I guess just understanding your, your values, like, before anything else, like like I'm a father and I'm a and I am a husband. Like my wife and kid are gonna always first and foremost come first. And so if that is the case, then I have to make my schedule or make myself available for what I value the most. Um, whether that means like telling somebody, hey, listen, I really would love to come out and warm up your team, but I have to be at home with my kid. Like that's what I have to do. Um, so just making sure that you know in your heart or hearts where your values are. And if that is what you value, um, maximize your time accordingly to what you believe in and also ensure that you are are strict with your nose. I think that was something that I struggled with too. Like 
coming up at first, I always wanted to be, I wanted to help everybody out as much as I could. So I would just say yes or everything and it just ended up becoming really taxing. So it it's almost more, it's almost more beneficial to give somebody a no than to say yes and then have to like cancel it on the back and then be like, hey, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. So learn to say no to people is probably going to be like your biggest tool. How'd you handle that? Being somebody, like you said, that wanted to say yes and you want to do a good job and typically you have to say yes to do that. And I ask as somebody that has felt the exact same way. So kind of hoping that, you know, any of our listeners will do the exact same. So I, once again, it's just learning to learning what you value and, um, yeah, you just got to learn what you value. And yes, it can be uncomfortable. Like I'm a person that's kind of wanting to avoid confrontation. So, but understanding that not confrontation may happen if I do say no, which it probably shouldn't because I'm only training your kids. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, like you have to be, you have to understand that confrontation may happen if you say this no, but this no means more to me because that's time with my kids or that's time for myself, whatever the case may be. Gotcha. So as you're on, you know, on campus and working and, and doing what you have to do, do you have uh, an athletic trainer like what is the what is the medical model in athletics in high school look like so we have two their names are nick and kb they're freaking awesome um they literally are like I, that's awesome I, I, I try to tell you like i truly am blessed so um nick has been out out of town for i think an athletic conference so i've just been talking to kb and she's been great um how it's been working for at least the month and a half that i've been there uh, one, first and foremost, I emailed her and make sure like I set time aside with her to talk to her about how strength and conditioning has gone in the past and how can I help her out to make sure that we have a fluid um, relationship, whether it be from like me telling a kid to go to her or vice versa, or what, programming, whatever the case may be. Um, and so how it works now is this. So if we have anybody that's returned to play, um, so I have like one ACL kid and I also know his sports PT, we actually used to work together. Um, I'll talk to the sports PT about what we have planned and I'll talk to KB about what the plan is, plan we have out set. She'll say like a yes to this, no to that. And then I just go about it from there. Um, we're like literally in constant communication about this one kid and it's been awesome. <clears throat> so as you go about that, and the reason I asked is how do you, within that work setting, <clears throat> are you the young guy on staff or is everybody else young? Because I, I lead that into the personal life because if, if everybody's kind of in the same boat, it makes it almost easier. And then you guys can all, you know, have that work life balance fluidity together because if you're all in the same boat. So no, I'm the youngest dude there. So they've been there for like, I think 20 plus years. So oh, okay. as long as I've been alive. So they actually told me like they, they told me the tricks of the trade and making sure that I learned to maximize my time with my family. Uh, Gilman offers like um, on campus housing. Like I was highly advised not to do that because there, there may be potentially a point in time where somebody might knock on your door and ask you to come do something real quick to learn to have that life separation. They also taught me how to like maximize my schedule. So if I'm able to do so, I'll meet with somebody to see if I can come in a little bit later in the day if I'm planning and coming in later. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they've been great and they've also been like mentors just to make sure that I learn to maximize my time with my family better. How did you handle being the new person on, you know, running a department because you're not the first, nor are you going to be the last. I mean, my Frazier up at Harvard was director, I think at 24, 25, DeMarco, same thing 24 25 like how do you handle being in charge of things at a younger age when some of the people that you're either collaborating with or are reporting to you are you know much older than you um I, to be honest I, I truly don't think about it that much like I've one just from a like I guess a confidence standpoint and and this is not thinking that like I'm the world's greatest strength coach by any means but like I know I've worked hard and I've got a decent like education base under me. Um, so I guess just having that confidence in myself to the to at least know that I can work with high school athletes and middle school athletes and do it a decent job of it. Um, and also just make also literally just being comfortable with my genuine self and understanding like, hey, like, I may make a mistake or two, but I have a team that can help me out. Um, 
and learn from my mistakes and go along about it. Like, I know I'm young, but I'm, I'm not a dummy and I can do this. <laughs> A hundred percent. I mean, the stuff that I've seen you put out and like you've, you've continued to grow and, and progress. How have you, I don't know if you've had this situation yet, but have you had anybody be like, I'm not doing that. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like I'm, I'm sure. that D one commit. Like I, I need it. You know what I mean? Like, and how do you handle that? For sure. So like, uh, of course, like, especially with high school kids and, and TikTok and things of that nature, it's like kids think that they know like more than they actually know. And so I'm the type of person where I like for, I guess, life to teach a kid rather than me like having to be like, oh, well, if you don't think this, let me prove it to you. Like, no, like, okay, if you don't think, if you think this is dumb, all right, keep doing what you're doing. Um, like, it's point, like I've, I've had a kid uh, come into my lesson, be like, no, nah, I'm just gonna do my own thing. And then like, all right, okay. So um, I'm training the rest of the group and um, this is not at the school I'm at, this is at another school. Um, months go on and, and kids are literally changing like body composition. They're moving faster. Um, and this dude is just stuck at wherever he is right now. Football season comes about and he ends up getting cut. So it's just like, but that's, a, I mean, it's just a, it's just a life. It's a, it's a life teaching thing. Like I'm here for your best interests. I've, I've learned things that I would love for you to try. If it doesn't, if you don't want, I mean, if you're not going to be accepting to it, I don't want to force this on you because that's the last thing I want to do. But hopefully you come about and learn to at least try it. Man, how do you do that though? Because like just hearing you say that, I'm just like, ah, but I know there's something good for you. Like I'm trying to help you out. It's, like it's, it's being patient. Like I, I deal with a lot of young men and I understand that sometimes young men need to learn, like life is going to be your biggest lesson. So like. I, I can give you this advice and I, and I want you to understand that I am here, I'm not here just to do things, but I'm here to try to make you better and a better person. If you're not gonna be accepting to it, that's okay. Um, if you find something that's better, awesome. Like that's amazing for you. I'm glad that you found that. Um, but if it doesn't work for you, like I, I try to help you and maybe you come back. Like I'm, I'm not that like, I don't, I, I, I don't know, like, it's, I've, and I've always been that way. Like, I don't want to have to force something upon somebody. Like, literally, sometimes life is going to be your teacher. No, I mean, that's, it's brilliant. It's just that I, like, I'm hearing it, and I'm like, man, I, I got to do a better job of that because and, I struggle with it because I feel like, not the same thing, like you said, not that I, I feel like I know everything, kind of like how you say, oh, I'm not the greatest strength coach. Like, I feel like, okay, I, I have this thing. Like, I know it can help you. Like, let me yeah. just help you. Like, it's almost like the Tom Cruise thing. Like, let, help me help you. Like, yeah. But like, sometimes you, you like, I, like, in as much as we love this and we want to help people, like sometimes people need to come to their own conclusions. I've learned that like dealing with athletes, but also people as a whole, like sometimes mm -hmm. you just gotta, you gotta learn it on your own. Man, um, speaking of learning, how have you continued like your programming, the stuff that you've put out on social media for people to see has continued to evolve and you've continued to, you know, refine and perfect your craft. What has been the biggest thing that you've learned in the last, I don't know, I'm not this three years or whatever. What have you learned? That's like, oh man, this has been the biggest light bulb moment. Um, like it's, it's kind of been like, this odd full circle thing, like, and I guess it's through social media and, and I guess just diving into those rabbit holes. But like at first when I started strength and conditioning, I, I saw exercises and I was like, okay, cool, speed power work. And then you do like your main movement and then you do your assistant stuff. Um, maybe, maybe every Tuesday and Thursday you do some running. I don't know why you do running, but you just do it. And then that was that, like, like that's just what I, like that's, this is day one, Steven, right? And then like you learn, you go about things and you learn more and you're like, oh, Charlie Francis, high, low method, oh, tempos, this is kind of cool. And then you <laughs> dive into that rabbit hole even further. And then all of a sudden, like you might uh, come past like, um, I don't know, freaking Louis Simmons. Oh, this is dope. Buddy Morris. Oh, this is dope. And then like you start learning different methods and things. And then it just ends up coming back for a circle like, oh, that's why Tuesdays and Thursdays we did tempo work. It's because they just did a high day. And so now I want to make sure that they're getting some level of recovery and getting some work done. So we're just going to knock out some tempos. Um, like, I guess 
that's been that's been like my very loosely that's been my full circle moment um i learned a method i've dived into weird and odd rabbit holes not odd but just different rabbit holes and now that rabbit hole has maybe come back and realize the why behind things and truly get an understanding of it um i feel like i didn't really answer your question no, I mean, you did like, cause that's, I feel like that's what happens with a lot of coaches too, though. Like we had Jeff Moyer on the show and Jeff was talking about, Hey, research a topic, um, learn about the topic, but then learn from like, okay, go to the back of the book, go to the back of the reference section and okay, yes. they learn from this. So how can you then keep pulling on that string? Because that is kind of the typical p path of most strength and conditioning coaches. And as you learn more, you start to realize like, shit, I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. Um, as we wrap this up, let you enjoy the rest of your day. What would be the, the biggest message that you would leave our listeners with of like, okay, this is, you know, my biggest piece of advice. This is the question that we, uh, have all of our, our, excuse me, our guests answer. Like, this is your opportunity to stand up on a soapbox. What would you tell everybody? Um, I guess my biggest thing that I would, okay. Biggest thing that I would tell like strength and conditioning community is just like, one, just make sure you have your values in, in hand. Like I, I, I believe everybody that gets into strength conditioning, they they love the field, they love researching things, and like they're all dialed into strength conditioning. But when it comes to like life values and having a social life and being like a human being, like that's kind of forgotten about. Working with people and things of like that, working with people especially, like, I think that you, your value should be, like, being a genuine person and having, like, or being a genuine person and making sure that you can connect with people, right? So, like, rather than just, like, being so dialed into strength and conditioning, maybe, like, try to socialize with people and get to learn about them and their, you know, what they go on with their day-to-day -day lives. Like, that's going to take you a ton further, even with your training, too with learning more about people and making sure that you value the person that's in front of you rather than your methods and your training philosophies. Amen to that. Um, appreciate you coming on, man. You uh, go about the rest of your day, enjoy it. And you, you got the weekend off. So you train the fo uh, football team earlier and uh, yeah, enjoy the, the holiday on Monday too, brother. Appreciate it. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.